Right, so agenda for the next half hour or so is just to quickly run through what memory scraping is, why investigate it, what, what's sort of the point, what's, what's, what's the benefit or the value. Um, then I'll give you a background to the, the genesis of, of this talk, which is an original tool called MemScan, which was born out of a, a pen test requirement from a client. And then after that, I'll introduce Nemesine, which is the new version. It has a few more features and capability for doing stuff around um, memory scraping on Windows uh, operating systems. Um, I'll talk about some limitations with the tool and this approach, the approach that I've adopted on modern Windows operating systems, so it's not 100% um, applicable to full poonage all the time. There are some restrictions as the, the modern OS is getting uh, better at securing binaries and running processes. And then I want to go on to talk about other use cases for memory scraping. So while I'll start with the, the usual use case that most people know about, which is its use in malware to steal credit card data. Having played with the tool and developed it, I, I feel like it's got a lot of potential use cases in red teaming as a post-compromise tool for instrumenting fuzzing. If you're trying to look for bugs in remote services or you're doing file format um, fuzzing, uh, and even malware analysis, if you want to do some dynamic analysis of running malware, um, I see some benefits in the approach of, of memory scraping. And then I'll just wrap it up with conclusions and if we've got time questions. So memory scraping, very simply, is scanning memory for data of interest. There's something that we want to get hold of that we know is probably in memory somewhere. It's usually something like credit card data if you're the bad guys or personal information, passwords, encryption keys, that sort of stuff. Um, and it's different to memory dumping in that it's usually dynamic and iterative. So because memory is volatile, it's changing all the time, if you want to monitor a process for incoming credit card data that might be changing on every transaction, you need it to be running against that process over and over uh, because that data will be volatile in memory. And that is different to a one-off memory dump, which will give, just give you one snapshot in time of a, a process's memory. So that we're talking about the dynamic iterative approach. Um, and you probably all are aware of the, the target breach. It, um, memory scraping got high profile after this where um, POS malware was actively using this sort of technique uh, and about 70 odd million credit card details were stolen. Uh, the, the malware was simply scanning memory for credit card data and then exfiltrating that out over a network socket to the uh, attacker's uh, machines. It's been around for a while. This is just a screenshot from US CERT date there. It's a bit small, but it's actually July 31st, 2014. Um, and it's certainly been around even since before then. So this isn't new stuff, and this was one example of one of the, the flavors of point-of-sale malware, which employs memory scraping techniques. There are many others. Uh, this list is by no means exhaustive. Uh, they've been given names as they've, as they've been found and uh, identified by malware analysts. Um, all of these are specifically looking for credit card data, typically, um, in the sort of target-style attack. So very interesting ones. I've not personally come across these because I've been doing this more from a penetration test perspective than a uh, malware analysis, but some very clever stuff goes on or some um, curious behaviors. The vSkin one, for example, copies itself to a, a registry key called PCI compliant to try and hide itself. So the attackers are quite savvy in some of the, the ways that they go about obfuscating um, the memory scraping that they get deployed on POS terminals. So the background to MemScan, which was the, the first tool, was a client in the retail sector, um, quite well known across, across the country, probably thousands, maybe tens of thousands of point of sales terminals. Um, they, they wanted to know, are we vulnerable to target style attack? This was soon after target. Um, they appreciated that they probably were exposed. They were very open and honest about having Windows 2000 and XP based POS terminals, fairly flat networks. So they wanted to know what their exposure was, if, if at all. Um, and on top of that, they wanted to know the level of difficulty involved. So uh, if you can do this, um, how hard is it? You know, what, what sort of level of sophistication are we looking at from a attacker perspective? So MemScan was the original proof of concept for this very simple .NET application which would search memory for certain strings that we'd be looking for. Uh, and I, I added in an option to have it pump out the data to a listing socket to have that sort of malware behavior so we could go to the client and prove, yes, here's it scanning memory and then shooting it out over a network socket to a, an attacker control machine. Um, 
I thought it was going to be really difficult. I'd never done anything like this. Um, I did write this initial tool in about two hours on the train on the way to client site to try and maximize time while there because in typical pen test fashion, they, you've got one day to do this. Um, so I tried to make use of that day as best as I could by preparing on the train, doing my usual coding method of stack overflow and munging stuff together till it works. Um, but there's um, quite good support within uh, Windows 32 native APIs for accessing process memory and doing some searches on that. So it's not actually that difficult. Um, but any, the, the output from that exercise was we got there, we tweaked the code, we got given access to a store, which was a mocked up store, but connected to the live infrastructure. So we could look at the tills, um, get on them, MS0867 or similar probably to get onto the XP tills, get the tool on, find the process that was reading the credit card data, and then pump it back out to our laptops as a proof of concept. And that was all verified within one day as a legitimate um, attack. So here's the link to MemScan. We released it back at the time, and my colleague Tom Watson added a lot more functionality to make it more POS specific. Um, he added better support for regular expressions, card specific data searches for track one, track two data, and mag stripe data searches. So that's been there for some time. By all means, uh, check it out if you ever do some POS terminal um, engagements. So Nemesine is the, the next version. As I said, I was playing around with this and saw some other potential applications of memory scraping. Um, for, for those interested, Nemesine is the personification of memory in Greek mythology, with the illustration on the side. Um, so it's a modified version of MemScan. It's less specific to searching for credit card data. You can, it's a generic memory scraping tool. And we'll, we've got some demos coming up to hopefully help you uh, see the, the potential there. Um, it includes a process hopping option. So the original version, MemScan, would just scan or um, scrape one particular process that you told it to. And the process hop lets you jump across all running processes. Uh, and you could do that iteratively. So you might want to be checking if a certain piece of interesting information or data is littered across uh, many, many processes on a running system. Uh, and it skips scraping attempts uh, against itself which makes sense, and any protected processes. And I'll, I've got a slide on that coming up, um, and that's one of the restrictions with the tool. So how it works, very simply, it searches a process memory space by pure read. So there are permissions on memory, whether you can read or write to it, depending on what the OS has assigned a running process. Um, if you have read permissions, which you commonly do, you don't typically even need special privileges to do that because reading memory is a very atomic function on an operating system. So if you can read the memory, you can start scraping it. And this is very different to hooking or attaching onto a process. Um, your process will run completely mutually independent of your target process that you're scraping. And if it has the read permissions, it, it can read or scrape that memory. Um, it only uses uh, .NET, native .NET Win32 APIs. I deliberately did that because I didn't want any third party dependencies on the code, wanted it as lightweight as possible. Uh, so it's very portable um, and it's, it works on Windows 2000 up to Win10. Uh, you might have to just compile it down to a certain version of .NET that's on the target system. And it searches for both ASCII and Unicode versions of your given search string, because as we were developing this, we, we realized or sort of understood that most strings appear in memory, <coughs> excuse me, in both forms, ASCII and Unicode. So by default, it will look for, for both versions without you having to specify that. And then it runs in an infinite loop. And again, going back to the start, the reason it does that is because memory is, is volatile and changing, there's a sort of a race condition between your scraper and what you're trying to maybe read because it might be coming into a process memory and either being overwritten or it might just disappear or something like that. So it will run infinitely until it's instructed to, to stop and hopefully give you a better chance of finding the interesting information that you're after. So it doesn't need any special privileges other than the, the read permissions on the process memory need to be set. Uh, and it, it's not really picked up by AV because it's not doing anything malicious. It's a pure memory read. Um, I've run it on several, um, several systems with different AV flavors, and it's just it's happily allowed to run without any uh, interference. And so there are three options for outputting. Uh, you can output to standard output um, to a TCP socket, uh, so you have a Netcat listener, or you can dump to a file on the local system. So there's three, three methods of uh, exporting. 
So very briefly, how it works, just to explain some of the concepts. So here you've got, say, a process ID 1472. There's some memory there. Uh, and then on the right here is just an illustration of some of the, the command line flags and what we're doing. So you say run dash O to output to the terminal, the process ID. Then the next value is the loop in milliseconds. That's a, a delay on when the scraper waits to go back to the start of the process memory to start scraping through it again. So if you set that to you know, 20 seconds or 30 seconds, it will scan the memory, wait, go back to the start, scan. So you can tweak that value depending on how volatile you think your process memory might be. But obviously, the lower that value, the, the more it's going to be spewing out output in an infinite loop. You then have this other value called the width. And this, again, is from our experimentation of using the tool and how we found it useful, is if you're searching for a certain keyword in memory, like password, usually that will give you a password for a system because things like system settings or variable names might be password equal. You don't know what you're looking for or the exact location in the memory where the actual password value might be. But if you search for the string password, and then look before and after that value, you might be lucky and find the actual password string itself. So the next value is what's called the width, and that means pull back all the data, 30 characters before and after my search string. And that increases the chance of you pulling back um, some data of interest based off your search term. So those are the only two real values to understand it. Otherwise, it's a fairly simple uh, usage. So uh, a very naughty demo to just show that concept. Um, so I've got HXD running there. This is me as the attacker. I'm going to set up a netcat listener pretending I'm on the internet. It's all in the same box for demo purposes. So I'm going to use Nemocene to first find the, the process ID that I'm, tar that I'm interested in of the, uh, the hex editor. Uh, it has a built-in process lister, so you, if you have restrictions on Task Manager, hopefully you can still, if you have execute permissions on, uh, permissions on Nemocene, you can find it that way. So we've got our process ID, which is 9028. So we're going to run, dash S means pump it to the socket, out to our Netcat listener on port 1337. And in this case, I've got a width and a, um, a delay of 200. And here, this is my actual Amex card number. So I'm not doing a regex, just my actual number. So it's now waiting for any time that that number in, in completion is typed into this process. So as I finish typing in the whole number, we'll hopefully see it spewed back out to the remote listener. So that's the data coming back. All the gumph before and after is the, the width data before, but there we see there's the, there's the number there. And we get whether it's in, that's the, the virtual address, colon U for whether it's a Unicode version or colon A for ASCII, just for a bit of uh, further information. So that's a very simple example of it working. Uh, and again, that was running on my system with, with full AV running, and it, it, it's not detected at all because it's not hooking, it's pure memory read. This is a busy slide, so don't, I won't go into this in too much detail, but this was off having used this tool a bit more as I was working on it. Some of the Windows binaries that I was searching for stuff, which I'm sure I was positive I was going to find stuff in there, um, it just wasn't working. I wasn't getting any feedback from the debugging in .NET. And after a lot of uh, searching, I found out that um, if there's a process that's what's called protected, um, since this feature has been in since Vista, then you can't access the virtual memory um, of a protected process. So certain Microsoft binaries that are signed by Microsoft and are protected, um, Nemocene won't work against those. Uh, but those bi binaries are few and far between. It's not too many. If you're talking about third-party applications, the Nemocene is typically going to work. So this isn't too much of a barrier, but more a, uh, a gotcha for Lookout. If you're wondering why this won't be working against some Microsoft binaries, it's possibly or probably because it's a protected process which is a good mitigation for those uh, particular binaries or processes. So that, that's um, sort of talking about useful memory scraping, get card data, that sort of stuff. But 
Uh, it feels like there's some potential usage in red teaming as a post-compromise tool. Usually you've fished someone, you've got code execution on their box, and then you want to pivot and leverage further access or gain more information about the individual who uses that, that, that compromised host. Um, so you might want to search their memory for passwords, encryption, strings, any sort of sensitive data, or you might just want to use it as an indicator of usage. You know, can you use this mechanism to understand if a user is online and they're actually using certain processes, etc.? cetera? Uh, and my thought being that eventually it'd be nice to build up a database of common search strings across different processes that you know will yield interesting uh, passwords or, or sensitive bits of information. So I've got a demo here. Um, it's quite brief, so I might run it through twice in case you miss it. It's me with my Chrome browser logging into uh, Amazon and me scraping the memory to get the plain text username and password. So I've shortcut it. I know what I'm searching for. That search string is the actual, it's in the web request when you log into Amazon. As soon as I log in, it's pumping out the request from memory. <coughs> And there I see in plain text the, the email address and the password is scrape for the win, exclamation mark. So this is basically, this is the web request which is crafted within Chrome uh, before it's gone through its SSL. So you're scraping the memory. It's, it's almost obvious that you will be able to access that data um, in memory in a point where it's not encrypted. And that's all that's happening here. And again, this, this is not detected by AV at all. So yeah, there's the password. So playing around with that, um, a, a good thing to do there if you want to sort of build a red teaming capability around that is if you take all your burp logs or you run your local proxy when you log into various web apps, you'll find and enumerate the different search strings from the login forms that are useful to user search strings within Nemesine. And so these are the ones that I found for some of the common sites that people use, myself included. So if you search for those against your, your browser process ID, you will um, possibly eventually get lucky uh, and get some creds to give you further access. Some other interesting ones, just if you're talking about browsers specifically, if you use Nemesine on a browser and just type HTTP, uh, as you might expect, you'll just get thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of data speed back, but that might include or will include search history, favorites, all sorts of stuff to do with your browser usage, which has been cached within the browser's process memory. So it's quite an interesting thing to do. And then another quick demo on similar lines. So this is against a thick client, my PGP desktop. This is me looking for the private key, my PGP private key. So I get the process ID of PGP desktop, which is 2872. Just write into output against that process with a width and a delay of, well, width of 500, delay of 200. I'm searching for what I know is the top of a, or the start of a PGP private key string. And there it comes back. There's the, the first 500 characters of my, my private key in memory. Forget you saw that. And then another option, so I talked about this at the start, a process hop. So if you want to sort of do a smash and grab or maybe look across all running processes, um, I added in this proc hop option, which does, as the name implies, jump across every running process that it can access and has read access to and scrapes for the search term of interest. So here, th this isn't a particularly interesting uh, demo, but I'm gonna process hop and search for, um, I think, the, the word private. That will come back with all the info where it's found and the process ID and the relative address within that process. Something to note about, um, if, you, if you download this and play with this or, or, or play around with memory scraping, um, you can get quite paranoid when you're looking at memory a lot because you might suddenly start seeing stuff in a process's memory which you think really shouldn't be there. 
you might see some passwords from a completely different application in a different process ID. Uh, but then you, then you suddenly realize, well, that, that's the nature of memory. If memory is not properly cleared down, there's no proper garbage collection, then residual memory might find itself in a different process space. So just a, another sort of nod there to not get too paranoid if you start seeing things in process memory, which uh, probably shouldn't be there. Either that or you are, co you are compromised and there's some malware running on your machine. So then another potential application I thought with this technique is um, instrumentation when fuzzing. So often when we're fuzzing, we're throwing large bu bunches of random data at either uh, listening services or we're doing file format fuzzing. But if we can put some identifier in that and then search for that or scrape for that within memory, then that might be a quick way to find out where certain issues like buffer overflows or whatever might be occurring and then we can have a quick jump point into, the, um, into our debugger and find exactly where in memory uh, those issues are occurring. Um, so, so that's the intention for possibly using uh, memory scraping in, in this vein. So for example, and I've got the demo, we tend to throw lots of A's at something, so if you searched for that and then there was some effect, we might get some hint as to where the issue in memory uh, occurred. So here I've got uh, a known old vulnerable small FTP server. So I'm just going to find its process ID, which is 1520. I'm just going to run against that process. And I'm going to search for a bunch of A's. And then here I'm just going to find my IP address so I know what, um, what to connect to. So I'll FTP to that IP. If I throw in a bunch of A's for the username, something happens, the connection suddenly closes, but Nemesine was constantly scraping and instantly it's found the, the address where the, the username or all the A's came in. So again, that could be an easy quick jump point into, um, into my debugger to find exactly what the issue there is, whether it's a stack overflow or, or similar. And then finally, um, one, of the, one of the things I was thinking about was possibly using memory scraping in malware analysis. Um, malware binaries are commonly packed. They might be stripped. They might have um, anti-debugging techniques or be aware that they're running in virtual machines. So all of that makes dynamic analysis of malware uh, very difficult because as soon as it detects that we, the researchers or analysts, are, know about it and are trying to instrument it in some way, it shuts down or doesn't exhibit, it, doesn't exhibit its full behavior. Uh, so nemesine or memory scraping might help in that sense because um, even if there is some encryption or obfuscation within memory at some point, that malware has to decrypt, to obfuscate, to do something, whether it's doing a, a command and control connection back out or accessing the file system or certain files, that sort of thing. Um, and unless the malware actually knows about Nemesine or tools like that, it won't be aware that Nemesine is necessarily running. You could be running this on a host machine outside of a VM. As I said, there's no function hooking, so it's not going to complain about any... Um, it's not going to kick in any anti-debugging techniques. So you might be able to use this technique to look for indicators of compromise within the malware while it's running, whether that's IP addresses, uh, URLs, uh, C2 endpoints, that sort of thing. Um, even things like scraping for any, any access requests to the registry or file system. And again, the, the process hop uh, option might allow for us to detect if it's doing something clever like process migration, or is it tainting or somehow using, leveraging other running processes to, to perform its nefarious tasks. So again, a very naughty example, but just to sort of show that this might be an interesting application of memory scraping. This is a very simple um, .NET application which exhibits some malware behavior. There's a string in there, all your secrets belong to us. It's constantly going to ping out to our lab's IP address. It tries to open a registry key uh, with a value of backdoor, uh, and then it, it writes to a file called exfil.txt, and there's an evil bad person, c2server.com um, endpoint in there. So all very noddy, but what we're going to do in the demo is see when that malware is running, how might be able to work out fairly quickly what, what it's doing. 
So here I'm going to run it, just compile that, call it malware XE, and that's now doing its constant polling out to our lab's IP address. So I'm just going to get the running process ID, which is 9952. And I don't know what I'm looking for in this case, so this is black box. So I sort of take a punt, and I might start for a search string just like www. I'm already getting something back, so I can stop that, and I can see some of the references to uh, the evil bad person, c2server.com. And I can see all sorts of other strings in memory at that time, which might be other indicators. And I see whether it's in ASCII or Unicode uh, format. So when I've got other indicators, I see it's trying to do a registry uh, look up there. So if I search for current as the next search, that might be, give me some more clues as to what's going on. And I get a bit more data back from the, from the process. I find that string about all your secrets belong to us. And I see the remote endpoint that it's pinging the DNS name and that reference to backdoor. So I know this example is quite contrived. It is fairly naughty, but it's just to show the concept that we can do this black box style and the whole time the malware is running and is completely unaware that we are doing this and inspecting or um, scraping its memory to try and understand what it's doing and how it's doing it. So a summary and some conclusions, um, I think that memory scraping does have some useful applications in cybersecurity, not just for stealing credit card data. I think you know, there's some good applications to other fields within cyber for bug hunting, malware analysis, um, that sort of thing, red teaming. Um, as I said, there are some restrictions on modern operating systems, but not too many. Um, some useful extensions to the tool would include being able to give it a whole list or database of search strings, particularly from a red teaming angle. Um, having some tunneling or proxy awareness or maybe even UDP or other options to exfiltrate might just help make it a bit stealthy. But to be honest, it's probably out of the realms of the remit of the actual tool, and we could probably fudge that in other ways. But it might be an interesting addition uh, further down the line. Um, a Unix version would be useful. Uh, one of my colleagues has actually got a... Um, a version of, of Unix um, mem scraping working to a degree. So hopefully we'll maybe get to release that at some point soon. Um, but a, an equivalent for Linux systems, I guess, would be useful to be able to do these things on uh, Linux platforms. And I think a PowerShell version is probably a little overdue as well, given all the PowerShell frameworks that we as pen testers are using. Um, it probably wouldn't be too difficult to turn this into a, a PowerShell version. So I, I made this public yesterday, so here's the tool. Uh, feel free to go and grab it, play with it, suggest changes, fork it, change it, make it better. Um, happy to take any feedback on that um, uh, and help to improve it in any way. If there's any bugs, by all means, bug me to fix the bugs. And that's me. I may have finished a little early, but that's time for questions, I guess. <laughs>